my dad's Southern Italian, he's Sicilian. And it's just interesting to me that, that they're being told they can't sit at the front of the trolley because they're colored. And I'm looking at her and I'm like, she's lighter than my Italian Nana. I didn't really realize the extent of Jim Crow in the north. Hi, I'm Danielle Romero. Thank you so much for being with me here on my channel where we have been digging in, where we've been digging into American history, uh, identity, family stories. And I had a lot of suggestions to watch this video. Uh, they're called the Delaney sisters. I've never heard of them before. Um, so I think that their dad was enslaved. That's, that's like all that I can gather from the video description. So it's a 10 minute video. I'm going to watch it with you guys for the first time. Stop, react. We could talk about it. I'm super excited. It says the, this interview was from 1994. So I was eight years old. So this is old, um, but I'm really excited to sit down. So let me know if you've heard of the Delaney sisters and grab a coffee. Let's sit down and watch this interview. When you, when your father talked to you about what it was like being a slave and what it was like getting his freedom, what do you remember about that? Did he say it was terrible being a slave? He was only seven years old when surrender came. And he really didn't know very much about slavery. So the only thing he remembered was as a child between six and seven years old, Little boys then used aprons and they buttoned one button in the back and that was all in the sleeves. So she remember going around the house saying, freedom, freedom, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free. So that's the only thing he remembers about real slavery. Now, and when you talk about surrender, you mean, tell me a little bit, the surrender means what? Means uh, <laughs> slavery is over. You're, you're free. And the surrender was Lee surrendering to That's the Union. Right. That's Just, right. Would you Lee tell me that? surrendered at Appomattox. That was surrender. And your mother was was unusual, wasn't she? Being oh. a mother and being a working person. Yes. Did that inspire you later on to Ooh, choose a career? All the time. <laughs> there was, was never anything that happened in my life, Mama used to say, if anything... If anything happens, you can always tell Mama. Tell Mama. And there used to be a book. I've, uh, so I have three kids, and and one of my daughters is about to be double digits, and I really want that relationship with her. It's something like we are. That's like my goal, and so I just I love hearing that, um, and that they're this old and they still remember that about their mom. That's so nice. Oh, Mama. And we told Mama, if Mama had asked us anything, she didn't have to take anybody else's word for it. She knew we were telling the truth. And you know, until today, she said, you don't lie to anybody. She says, if you lie, you are afraid of them. Your parents always told you to present yourselves in a dignified way, but Bessie, you had a pig that your father didn't approve of. Tell me a little about that. They had okay. connected with the school or farm, and this little pig, a little white a male pig, was thrown over to be dead. Well, I, of course, grabbed him right up, went and got my bottle and sucked and taught him how to suck the bottle. Really sure that's what and he just thought I was, he just thought I was God because everything that pig wanted, I gave it to him. But your father didn't like that. Well, well he grew to be so big, he was afraid. He, he, was, was, he, was, he weighed about 500 pounds and he would follow me all over the campus, everywhere. He, and had, the, he had to take him away from him. And, he was, he, and he had these great touches grow up over his um, snout, and he would, I, if I'd call, he would break and run. But Papa didn't like me running around there with that bull pee. Why? And, well, but he thought it wasn't dignified. Well, hmm. I don't know. He just didn't like it. And, but I insisted. And so, uh, when he, they finally, he bit one of the attendants who kept, 
and bit him in his privates. Mm -hmm. So that was a good excuse to get the pig get away from me yeah. and me away from the pig. All right, but on the issue of respect, tell me the story, because that goes to your father's core. He insisted on respect, and you respect people, and they respect you like the white people would always call people by their first names. Tell me about how your father insisted that black people be called by their by Mr. and Ms. One but one way. Just he they said, did if you did, said, if they didn't know your first name. He so said, they decided that they would call each other Mr. and Mrs. Delaney. And that's what they did. They set the example. And when we would ask them, they they call Aunt Amy. He says, Is she married? I said, Yeah. Well, if she's married, she's earned her title, and you give it to her. She's Mrs. And, she, they, and he insisted he that white He insisted that we call all, all the people around there would call you Aunt Suki and Aunt anything to keep from calling you Miss. So it must have done. So that reminds me a little bit, and I haven't looked into it, but you know the whole, like, Aunt Jemima syrup thing? Uh, I'm sure you remember, like, the bottle... Uh, and I think they just got rid of it. And I never really knew, like, why is it called Aunt Jemima? Um, and so I can understand hearing this is that there is a sense of, like, instead of giving black people titles, like white people have, like, Mrs. So-and-so, Mr. So-and-so, they'd be saying aunt. And it sounds like their, their father found that to be demeaning. Um, so let me know if I have that right on him that Miss and Mr. were titles of respect. The other thing is that you grew up very protected. Your parents were nervous about exposing you to white men who were taking advantage of black women. I like I like to got lynched uh, when we were all meeting at Wake Cross, Georgia, because I was a fight. I didn't take tea for the fever. I had long hair, came down here, and it was had plenty of it. I used to go to the barber once every six months and have it thinned out. I had so much. I just uh, masses. So I was there in the colored waiting room. They had everything colored in white. And this was down in way across Georgia. It was a place that the trains met to go to Birmingham. So anyway, while we were there, this white man that I call a rib, he came by and saw me combing this long hair. I can imagine it now, but it never occurred to me then. And so he began to make passes at me. Well, I had never had anybody make any passes at me. I had been brought up with decent people, and they treated me in a decent way. And when he made a pass, I said, get out of here and go on around there with your other whores and and uh, in your sign. So he, uh, oh, this nigger bitch has insulted me. The crowds gathered and they looked in to see this woman. I didn't seem to be bothering anybody, but he just insisted this nigger bitch had insulted him. When the train came, they got on the train and let me go on. And, and uh, I think that the people were very glad. I think that most of the people realized that he was drunk. Mm -hmm. Now, in your book, you say that Jim Crow, which came in in 1896 and established the segregation laws, Jim Crow changed everything. How did it change your life? I love, we loved the whole family. Two families of us would get uh, together once a year and go to the park. And then something changed all of a sudden, right, yeah. Sadie? Well, when we went to the park, we'd always get in front of the streetcar, five cents to go out to the streetcar. And this time, the man said, get to the back of the car. I said, well, why? We want to get to the front. We want to our hair to go through our hair, you know. <laughs> he said, get so long, you have to get to the back. And then we found out that there was Jim Crow. And so we could, went on and got in the back of the car. And then when we went to get water, then every place had a dipper, a tin dipper. And you just take the tin dipper and dip and drink your water. 
but they had put something over the middle of it, just a slat over the middle. And said white on this side and colored on that side. And so Bessie took it, and she said, I'm going to get me some white water. And she <laughs> hit the water, she had to just dip over, you know, and drink that water. Now tell me when you got up. <laughs> I just... <laughs> Like, you have to laugh because otherwise you will cry. But again, as a mom, I I totally can see children saying something like that and doing that because I think um, children really, they they just illuminate the foolishness of so much of this, the, the things that adults are doing to each other. And I just feel like children illuminate that. Um, it's the same water. It's the same water, right? Uh, you found Jim Crow up north too, right? Wow. In dentistry, you, all of your work is more or less about the, around the mouth. And you had to set up teeth. And I could ever more do it. They're all the children would come to me. They said, let me, let me get marked. When I went and got up, and he said, no, this wouldn't pass. So, uh, Sadie... Goodman, the youngest child in the class, she had to wait to take her state board. She was so young. And uh, she came, Bessie, give me you. Well, let me take you and check it. I said, they won't take it. I said, and they failed me. She said, let me try it anyhow. So she must have had an idea that there was something wrong. She took my work that they failed me on and passed on. And okay. all the other students. I was the only one that failed. Well, that, that okay, so she's saying that she was trying to pass a test, I think she said for doing dentistry work or something, and she failed. And then her friend, I think her white friend, took the work and submitted it, and it passed under her name. So the only reason she failed, and this was up north, was because she wasn't considered white. I think that's what she's saying. It was a, a case of a real mean discrimination because they didn't need to do that. Wasn't there a school where you didn't let them know you were coming? You just showed up? Oh, well, Tell that, me that. that was after when I got appointed. You had three years to get appointed after you passed this examination. So we job a color person. And they wrote me. They took the three top on the list. And of course, if you were colored, they just skip over you and take the other two. And so, uh, my brother knew a, a fellow that worked down at the Board of Education. And he told him, you tell your sister when they write for her to come for an interview at the school. Says, don't go. And say, they won't know she's colored. And then they'll appoint her. And then when you, when you go up there and you appoint her, you can do nothing about it. <laughs> so I made an excuse, and I didn't go. And they just appointed me. And when I appeared, there, this colored girl, they could do nothing about it because I was appointed. So there's something really interesting to me, and I know we, we've talked about this a lot on the channel. So these women, their parents, I'm assuming both, I know at least their father was enslaved as a child. I don't know if their mom was. It's just interesting to me because... You know, I have African-American ancestry on my mom's side. But let me tell you something. This this sister in particular reminds me so much of my dad's mom. And it's like they don't look alike, but there's something that's really similar, except she's lighter than my dad's mom. And uh, You know, my dad's Southern Italian. He's Sicilian. And it's just interesting to me that that they're being told they can't sit at the front of the trolley because they're colored. And I'm looking at her, and I'm like, she's lighter than my Italian nana. Um, just, it's all nonsense, isn't it? When you look back, what do you think has been harder, being black or being a woman? Black. Being black. Being black. Okay, that was hard. I wish they had spent more time on that. Um, that was incredible. And I think I didn't really realize the extent of Jim Crow in the North. I mean, being a New Yorker, you know, I have roots from Louisiana, but I didn't grow up there and I grew up in New York. And I think when I was growing up in New York, 
I remember learning about the Civil War and stuff, and everyone in New York um, in the classes, we were just on such a high horse about not being Southern and, and being part of the Union. And you're a kid, you're only getting a little bit of the story, you're not getting all the nuance, you're not getting all these angles. Um, but I think it is important to point out that uh, winners write history, right? And the North won. And so there's this sense of like the South was so racist, the South was so bad, and the South was racist, it was bad, but it was bad everywhere. And I think with what they're sharing goes to show that. So this was excellent. Um, thank you for recommending it. Thank you for being here. If you've uh, watched a few videos on the channel and you like it, um, and you'd like to support the storytelling that I'm doing, there's a couple ways you can do that. One is just to share these videos and to subscribe and share your thoughts in the comments. I love the engagement with the community. Uh, you can also send me a coffee. Uh, I have a link in the comments for that. I drink a lot of coffee while I'm editing, so you literally can send me coffee, which is amazing. And I'm wearing my NYTN hat today. And if you like flat rim snapbacks, which I do, I'm from New York, um, I'll leave a link to where you can grab that too. But thank you so much for being with me as we're learning together and we'll talk soon.